Well, welcome to the bunker level of Feldspar Television Productions in the greater Yorkfield, Illinois metropolitan area. This is the third sublevel of what is left of the old studio complex. Lots of miscellaneous leftovers are down here. Different things that apply to different things. I filled it up with some personal stuff, but there's a lot of junk left over from the uh, old TV studio days. But I wanted to show you something. See this? Those are my grandmother's brass knuckles. Yeah, I got them from my grandmother. Now, I gotta be honest, I don't know the complete backstory on these suckers. Um, and if people, if you don't know what brass knuckles are, what you do is you hold them in your fist like this and you smack people, usually full in the face, sometimes on the side of the head, sometimes in the back of the head. A kidney shot is usually pretty good. But uh, here's the thing about grandma. She was the oldest of nine, or excuse me, she had nine kids. Uh, she could have confiscated this from any of the four boys more likely from one of the five girls. But Grandma worked in the Union Pacific Railroad Yard in Council Bluffs, Iowa. And uh, I think she carried these around for her own protection. There were hobos in the yard, vagrants, bums, thieves. Uh, it was a huge railroad yard. I mean, Council Bluffs, Iowa is the sixth largest railroad center in the entire United States because all the rail traffic from around the country feeds in the Council Bluffs to cross the Missouri River to get on the Transcontinental Railroad. She lived two blocks from the yard and she had these so when she moved to the nursing home these got sent over to me. I don't know who got the zip guns and the rifles. Her 25 caliber handgun, now that was something uh, she had borrowed from one of her sons after a pair of guys tried to break into the house. I remember that 25. It was an automatic. And I remember at one family party, some of the uncles stood out in back trying to shoot the pigeons that were about eight feet away. And they went through about three full clips, and they didn't hit one damn bird. Uh, well, you know, that's just the way things are. Well, anyways, before I ever got the brass knuckles, I improvised. All right, I don't know if you can see this too well. Uh, pennies. All right, so there's 50 pennies in here. It's scotch taped. You keep this roll of pennies in your pocket and then you slug people full on in the face or in the side of the head or the back of the head. Kidney shots are good too. Um, yeah. The neat thing about this is I actually made this like 50 years ago and I have no idea of how old the pennies are inside this thing. So this might just save my life by being a weapon or a penny in here might provide for my retirement when I cash it in. Oh golly, look at this. This is in case the helicopter SWAT team comes in. Uh, more self-protection. There's a story about this. You ever see a box like this? Uh, you know, the ironic thing is, is this whole place is wired for like 480 volts because of the old studios down here and all the old lighting equipment and the uh, lifts and things like that. But do they have a regular light circuit down here? Heck no. Anyways, check this out. Innocuous little box. You open it up. And what is in it? Why? 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 It's a straight razor. Okay, so in the old days, somebody shaving, you know, uh, let's see, here's Russia. Now, if we wanted to scrape Russia off the map, okay, that's what a straight razor does. It's excellent use of foreign policy. All right, so there's a story with this some, um, oh, seems like a century ago, York High School. I had been to a party and I had 
wore my black leather jacket, tough guy look, you know, Fonzie and all that. I don't think he was all that tough, though. You know, my mom grew up in Wisconsin, and she was in Milwaukee in the 50s, and the only thing she liked about uh, Happy Days or Laverne and Shirley was the theme songs. She said, there's nothing to do with Wisconsin. Well, anyways, I go to a party. I forgot I had this in my inner pocket. So one day I'm at school, and I realize, uh-oh, this is probably not a good idea to have on me. <coughs> of course, it was a different era back then. <coughs> Excuse me. So, what I did was, uh, I'm in my consumer education class, bored out of my mind, and I'm sitting directly in the front center of the room with my desk right up against the teacher's desk. You know, In fact, here's an old school desk right here. My desk, teacher's desk, and on her desk was a box of Kleenex, and I took the razor, and when nobody was looking, I very neatly sliced the outline of the bottom of the box, and then I replaced the whole thing on the uh, uh, desk. Now, my girlfriend just happened to be in the class afterwards. That was Mrs. Graham's English class, and she was a neat little lady, very short, very skinny, and very quiet for the most part, very frustrated with her kids who didn't want to learn Shakespeare. And she's in the class, and somebody sneezed and asked for a Kleenex, and so she goes to pick up the box to pass it back through the room. And when she picked it up, the bottom came out, and my girlfriend says it was like it was snowing in there for a couple of seconds. She said it was the biggest laugh of her life. And it was all she could do to keep from boarding out. It was me because she knew I sat in almost the exact same chair in the class before. Oh, good old days. Let's see. I think that's the Montenegrin flag. Uncle Melvin was involved in uh, exploiting the post-Yugoslavia situation. Okay, here's the old collection of uh, rubber stamps. There's like two dozen rubber stamps up there. Magic 8-Ball, binoculars. Uh, oh, this is what I wanted to show you. This is the uh, survival knife thing. I picked up three of these at some point. Uh, they were cheap. It was like three for ten bucks. Now this was a big craze back in the 70s. You buy the survival knife. Now check this out. Um, let's say the nuclear war is starting and you have to build a shelter. Well, you can saw trees down with this and open up your beer cans with the can opener. And then, the little screw off thing just came off. <laughs> A compass that's worthless, always has been worthless. Can you see, whoop, you know I pulled the wrong thing off, I keep doing that. I guess that's the secret compartment. All right, inside the handle, that little plastic bag, there's like three matches in there, uh, all-purpose waterproof matches, there's some fishing line and a couple fish hooks. So, when the nuclear war starts, um, you will be able to stay alive uh, with this knife. Now, I will mention the blade. By the way, these old chairs came out of a house in uh, Council Bluffs, Iowa, 15th Avenue. Uh, the blade here is worthless. I don't know how many times I've tried to sharpen it. It's made out of the worst, dullest steel... I'm not sure I would even want to use this as a butter knife. No, just no good. All right, books. All right, so check this out. Now, back in the uh, 70s, I got a hold of the government publishing house. I think it's Pueblo, Colorado, uh, Pueblo, Colorado Springs, something like that. So I found all this stuff, and it was really interesting. Here's the Northeast Asia situation. All right, U.S. efforts versus the Warsaw Pact, the Fox Bat, the Flogger, the Fish Bed, the Phantom, the F-18. Uh, buried in there somewhere 
is a reference to the new attack helicopters coming on the line and I believe it's referencing the Apaches which is kind of neat check this out Harold Brown Secretary of Defense check this out Patriot missile isn't that cool when was this uh, 79 so we are still head to head with the Reds this one here's a book I would recommend um, a very long weekend uh, the Army National Guard in Korea, 1950-53. to 53. You gotta love this with the artillery. Beautiful stuff. Um, I'm claiming free use or whatever as far as the copyright on that thing goes. I'm just showing the cover and it's for reference purposes. I'm not plagiarizing or anything. But anyways, my father's experience in the Korean conflict was... Uh, after he got his basic training in heavy, heavy weapons, uh, he trained in cruise serve weapons like 30 caliber guns, 50 caliber guns, mortars. Uh, he shipped to Korea, literally on a ship with the bunks that were six high and people vomiting from six bunks high to the bottom. Three weeks on that. Gets to Korea, comes off the gangplank. The guy who met him, now he was going to be an individual reserve. And my dad figured he was going to be up on the front line, you know, really, really quick. So he's going through the processing depot, and they process him, and the officer says, do you know anything about artillery? Dad says, no. And uh, the uh, officer said, well, you have three weeks to learn, uh, or you're going to go on the front line. So Dad got assigned to the 40th Infantry Division, which is the California National Guard. It was a process called Federal they were federalizing the National Guard troops. So when the war broke out, the National Guard was rushed overseas. Um, after they'd been there, the regular army was finally geared up to go in and replace. So my father was sent in as a replacement. His specific unit was the 981st Field Artillery Battalion the fire direction center also known as the headquarters battery where he spent 15 months in like four or five different places in bunkers the entire time um, he was shelled I asked him sitting in the bedroom one day with him watching TV and this was so oh, 10 years ago or so and I said well how close did the shelling get to you and he goes you see the kitchen and we could look through the hallway there and you can see the kitchen and I like, yeah and he goes that close so anyways, uh, that's what he did. You know, he sent the shells. He was actually decorated out of laziness. Uh, Dad was sort of a genius, and he noticed the pattern of calculations. And you were using uh, slide rules in those days. And he noticed there was a reoccurring pattern of calculations, so he drew up a chart. And the chart was a shortcut, and it saved he can't remember was like three to eight seconds he says it wasn't much but three to eight seconds when you're on the battlefield and you got the red army approaching you i should say the uh shy comms, uh and the north koreans coming down your throat well if you can sh shave three to eight seconds off your artillery mission that's a big deal so uh that book there very long weekend has a lot of those experiences in there all right, let's take a quick look at the Mad Magazine collection plus some of the other stuff. These are all those old collected 70s comic books. Now there's some weird stuff here. Devil's Triangle, Outer Space, Ripley's Believe It or Not. Oh, the books on that shelf, those are all miscellaneous books. And then there's the Mafia collection in there. I don't know how many books I got on the Mafia. I remember reading the Capone book when I was like nine years old. <laughs> Formative reading skills. Well, anyways, usually on this shelf down here is where I have my collection of nuclear defense secrets. So here we got civil defense systems, programs, and policies. Uh, these brown envelopes, these are slideshows. 
what happened was is back in the I think it was the 80s maybe the 90s I had called over to the federal publishing house in Colorado and I had requested a specific book but when I was on the phone with these people I said hey what do you got on civil defense and he says well yeah we got some stuff and I said can you send it to me he says what specifically and I said I don't know do you have a standard package he goes well I'll send you whatever we got so like uh, Two weeks later, there's this giant box appears on my uh, front porch. It was like 18 inches by 18 inches by 18 inches. It was just stuffed full of books and stuff like this. Soviet Civil Defense Agriculture Preparedness. Well, damn it, the Soviet Civil Defense is prepared. Look at this. They have a hierarchy organization. Uh, Post-attack, reconstitution of... Uh, SR90 and the milk, beets, rutabagger, turnips. Uh, this is my favorite one, I think. Report of the Joint Fire Police Task Force on Civil Unrest. Okay, recommendations for organization and operations during civil disturbance. Okay, so if you're with the government and you want to know how to put down a food riot, this is the go-to book. Okay, here. If you want to put down a food riot, this is the Los Angeles anti-food riot hierarchy. Uh, this is the way to do it. And as California goes, so does the country. Recovery from nuclear attack. Okay, I love this one. It's the 10 barriers to well-being. Oh. Somebody actually thought of all this crap. Uh, you know, I never did watch the slideshow because I don't have a slide projector. I got to get a hold of one. Guide for the evaluation and alert notification systems for nuclear power plants. Yeah, that'll come in handy. Uh, radiological instruments. I had a... It wasn't a Geiger counter, but it was very similar to the Geiger counter, and I can't find it now. Um, I must have given it away to some guys I know that, uh, you know, student movies, that sort of thing. And that was a neat thing. Nuclear Radiation Shielding. Everybody should read this one. Uh, shelter Analysis for Nuclear Defense from Initial Nuclear Radiation. A protection Factor Computation Service. Okay. Law and Order Training to Put Down Food Riots. Okay, this is the guy here, and yeah, he'll have the uh, AR, and he'll start blasting away at the people who are trying to get into uh, the market. Okay, this is just a road map of Chicago from an old standard, uh, God, look at that, it must be from the 60s. Winter storms, there's some mixed up stuff, 50th anniversary Korean War, Elmhurst winter storms. This came from the Rock Island Arsenal. Preparing makes sense. Tornado protection. Several times in my life, I have been very close to uh, uh, tornadoes. And I would say you really should learn about it. Okay, weapons of mass destruction, nuclear scenario. The family disaster preparedness checklist. Okay, what would that be? Family disasters. Okay, running out of peanut butter. No money for pizza night. Uh, car goes flat on the van when you got to get to a soccer game. Those are family disasters. This was the thing they sent. All those little check marks there. This was like the uh, packing slip for all the stuff they sent me. Now this one here is actually a good one. If you have to read any one of them, and there's a lot of caveats attached to this, buyer beware, but this one has some of the best information. Uh, a nuclear war it tells you how to make uh, filters it tells you how to do sanitary bring in air expel air uh, how to make shelters uh, look at this here's some guys making a shelter here's a guy making a shelter here's a pick digging itself a shelter uh, improvised lighting you take a candle, you put it in a can, and it's a light as well as a heater. Permanent family shelters for dual use. 
I hate to say it, but that she looks like she's, you know, sitting doing something there. Okay, sanitary. Water sump pumps. Ah, mushroom clouds. So this talks about ground burst, ground burst versus air burst and that sort of thing. Switch right to Elmhurst, and Elmhurst is the town that had the one possible nuclear shelter that they bulldozed. Big snow is 67. Elmhurst College history. Elmhurst propaganda. A history of the Metropolitan Sanitary District. Uh, this is Anthony Raymond from the Hillside Police Department. Uh, he's still on patrol at Harrison at the top of the hill in Hillside. You folks can look up Anthony Raymond. <sighs> but I strongly feel he's still on patrol. Alright, so Elmhurst Maps, old Elmhurst Maps. Emergency Preparedness Guide, yeah, let's... Uh -huh. Ancient Elmhurst, Ancient Elmhurst, Ancient Illinois. What do we got here? Oh, Journal of Illinois History. Oh! So over here, the old Collier's Encyclopedias. I've noticed in a lot of old movies, 50s and 60s, they have these encyclopedias sitting on the shelf there in the background. And that's really kind of neat. Uh, one of the other neat things about Collier's was they did a encyclopedia yearbook uh, covering the year. All right. So we got those for quite a few years. It was like the late 80s, that early 90s. We finally discontinued them. They were getting to be like 35, 50 bucks each. Uh, but some of the information is still current and I hate throwing away books. Now check this out. When they bought the encyclopedias, they got a forever calendar. That's kind of cool. I have no idea how it works. So this place is loaded with books. Uh, this one room and the annex is like 10,000 books. Um, Civil War, Great Plains, shortwave radio. Now, in order for this to work, it goes to the old antenna mast. Now, the original antenna mast at the south end of town was close to 150 feet high. Um, it was on top of this bunker building, which is like two and a half, three stories tall, which has the weird corner that sticks up, which has the base of the antenna. So the old base of the antenna is still there, like eight feet of it, 10 feet of it. And I was able to run a line up there and I can bring in some pretty good stuff. All right. A Door County, well, they call it a guide. I'm still looking for the 1960s fun map. There's a lot of stuff in here. Made these things in shop class. All right. This was my grandfather, the other side of the family. His marbles from, would you believe these are from like 1914? When you're in elementary school, you make stuff like this. I shall return. I will stand and fight here. Gee, what's this thing? I made this in art class. Looks like an upside down cross on here. It's not. <laughs> Look at that. Oh. You gotta love this stuff. Well, anyways, the uh, the Civil War guys. These are Bretain figures. Uh, my very first one was a Mountie, and he's pretty truncated. He's in here somewhere. But over the years, I collected a lot of these. Um, in the Chicago area, they might have been sold exclusively at Marshall Fields. They were very expensive. They worked out in the old days, 50 years ago. I think these were about $2 each. I always liked the artillery batteries. But there was also Western sets. They had like World War I, World War II sets. And then Moses. I think this is Moses. That's his ark there. 
But here's Moses helping the Confederate artillery at Shiloh. All right, my last permit for O'Hare Airport. That's a Corgi bus. Yeah, Corgi. Uh, they made all sorts of stuff. These are very expensive. They're not really toys. They're collectibles. These are things you put on the shelf. I didn't know any better, so I treated it as a toy, which is why it's so beat. A friend of mine had a huge collection of these things. But I'm going to sign off. You know, a lot of books down here. I have a habit of not turning in my textbooks, selling them back. I love humor. Did I tell you about the Mafia collection? Yeah. Alrighty, so if I can ever find that radioactive device uh, for detecting the radiation, I'll let you know. And so from Television Headquarters, Feldspar Television Productions. We are signing off.